people in the most efficient way um, that makes sense. Connecting with Scott Davis and connecting with Dan Collingridge, they're different people and they connect with people in different ways. And, uh, and what Swap allows is for whatever the reason you have to connect with somebody, it gives you that ability to be able to do that in the most efficient way. And so some of the technology that we're do using, for instance, is I, I may talk with Dan and completely forget to get his information or um, and giving you maybe a little bit of a heads up of, of my story is uh, how this came to be is I completely forgot. Someone who I've known for years, I hadn't seen them for years, I ran into them and I couldn't remember their name. And uh, I went home on Facebook and I, uh, I started searching for them for like a half an hour. It turns out they didn't have a Facebook, so that was a waste of time. Uh, but I, I got that person's phone number and I was too afraid to ask that person what their name was because I should have known what their name was. So I have this blank contact in my phone and I thought there's got to be a better way f of doing this. And so, uh, for instance, some of the technology that we're using, us in our room, we can keep our phones in our pockets this whole time. And, uh, and we can go back later and I can, knowing that I've, my phone knowing and swap knowing that I was talking with Dan for 20 minutes um, at Lift the Rock today, I can go home later tonight and Dan's gonna be on my phone waiting for me and I, I, can, I can see his LinkedIn, I can see his Facebook, I can see whatever he wants me to see all in one place and then choose to connect with him in whatever way that I may choose to do so. Um, so yeah, so when you're ready to connect, basically this is Brian Cox, this is his profile. This, these are all the things that he has available for people to connect with him on. And, uh, and this picture is just showing that I am connected with him on all these different things. So what Swap is essentially doing is we're taking all these different identities that one may have and we're creating one identity for that individual. And then, uh, so your phone network, your email network, your Facebook network, your Instagram network, whatever networks that we're, we're taking all these people in your life and we're putting them into one place and we're giving everyone one single identity. Um, so we realized uh, pulling this off, um, if, if anything I learned, um, and I, I, I won't bore you with, with much about me because it really is all about these other people. It is everything about bringing people who are better, smarter than you. Uh, I feel that way about everyone on my team. Everyone on our team comes from an extremely diverse background. And, uh, and I feel very fortunate for the opportunity to work with all these people. But what brought us together uh, was this idea, this idea that we believe that no matter the different experiences that we've all had, that we have the opportunity to do something perhaps bigger than anything that we all collectively have done before. And uh, that's really what's worked for our team. And uh, it, it's a great pri privilege working with everyone. Um, so yeah, so we built it. Um, what's exciting is just um, about, what, two days ago, uh, we just got approved on the App Store, uh, on, the, on the Apple's App Store, and, uh, and we're gonna have Android ready here in just about a week. So we're really excited. So we're uh, right now just preparing to launch this thing and, uh, and get the word out with it. And so we, we appreciate you guys taking the time to listen, and uh, I guess this is a time for questions. And uh, these guys are smarter than me, so I'm gonna bring them up, and these are the guys you wanna talk to anyhow. So um, yeah, if anyone has any, any questions. All right, who's got questions for Swap? Anybody. <laughs> so I want to know what kind of people we can help connect you to because we didn't ask that earlier. So if you guys are going to maybe have a presence here, what, what do you need from the community? Right. Well, I think what we're finding with any tech community, so um, I had the privilege, what was really exciting, I went to, I'm from Maryland, but I went to school in Provo, Utah. And what's really exciting is, is just over the past several years, um, the tech scene there, uh, I had the opportunity to just really it seemed like come out of nowhere. And what's exciting is as of last year, um, yeah. it, it, Provo was able to become, or, or Utah in general, uh, more venture capital, uh, capital per capita than any place in the United States. And what was cool was just, it was because of this community that was built. And what we love about Little Rock is that sense of community where I think you really can't find this in many other places. I've lived in the Bay Area and there's a lot of great things, a lot of talented people on one place. I think uh, what, what we're realizing with Little Rock and, and where we see uh, a huge potential for, it's just the sense of community here. And, uh, and what we're looking for is we're just looking for driven people and, and to uh, be a part of this community and, and finding those who want to you know, build, in, build a community that uh, it really takes each other to do so. It takes more than just one company. It takes, you know, several people coming together. And I think what we're looking for is uh, we're looking for anyone, especially in the area, who would be interested in, in coming on this ride with us and, and looking for an opportunity to 
uh, basically go through, we, we went through, not to say there's not a lot of hard work ahead, but um, the past year, I mean, it, it was brutal. It took, it took a lot to get to the point that we're at. And so we really feel that the fund's just beginning and uh, we're looking for the right people to, uh, to continue helping us to, to build the future that we see, so. Hey Mitch, so have you, do you know what Plaxo is? Do you remember the word Plaxo? I do, I do know what Plaxo, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you do. So it reminds me a little bit of Plaxo, right? Which was probably in early 2000s. It, as long as I had it and you had it in my Outlook address of where you worked, your right. title, your phone number was always in, in sync. So is it a similar model in that I need the app and you have to have the app, but as long as we both have the app, then we stay connected in that, in that fashion? Right, well, and, and you think of, uh, I mean, Facebook, a lot of the big social networks, I mean, that was kind of the model that you had to, that you had to have. And, and for us, the, the, the frustrating thing with, with Facebook is a lot of people don't have Facebook. And uh, a, a lot of people do, but the, just because you have a phone number, uh, you, you should have a way to connect with people giving that person your phone number without having to have a Facebook for everyone to go and find you on, right? And so what we tried to create and tried to be innovative is this problem of obviously if I have swap and you have swap, uh, we're going to be able to do things that outside of swap you aren't able to right. do. Um, but we, what we wanted to do, especially with the onboarding process of getting to that point of reaching a critical mass and getting people on here, I mean, that's the big hurdle for pretty much mo most people, especially people in our situation with this type of platform. And so what we've tried to create is during that onboarding process of allowing it so I could be on swap and you not be on swap, but to provide ways that would basically make it so for me being a swap user, um, I can still connect with you in a preferable way while still trying to get you and encourage you to come on swap, um, but still to be able to use our, our tool and our platform even if others aren't on there yet. If I'm the first person and no one else in the world is on, I can still use this platform um, in a way to market myself uh, which would be able to be helpful to uh, how we see it, onboard others, make it easier for others to join, but still not hinder me. I can still do stuff with me being the only person in the world on swap right. and no one else having it. So, so just last thing, on tactical on that, then walk us through a couple of scenarios. So you're on swap, then you need at least my phone number or my email. So maybe break that down a little bit. Yeah, right. so, Scott, do you want to, or Dan? Yeah, so when you onboard Swap, you can add whatever you want. So the phone is mandatory, but email and all your other socials are not mandatory. So as a Swap user, I can go ahead and share my profile out on my other social networks. You have people all the time that are on their Instagram, they're listening, hey, follow me on Tumblr or follow me on, on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. They're posting it on their different social networks. So I can use that as a way to broadcast myself to everybody else. If we actually want to use the app to its fullest potential, yeah, you both would need to be on it to have all the location services, but I can still add whatever I want, and if you onboard, you can add whatever you want and use it for those purposes. And so you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to have your email, and, and I have to have my email, but we can still connect in certain ways. There's some share functionality in there that allows us to do that. Does that help? I'm sorry, what was your name, sir? Gary. Gary, that was a great Thank question. You, Thank you. I'm old enough to remember Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so um, two, two really quick questions. The first one is, how are you guys leveraging address book um, in, in, in building your solution? And then the second question is, what exactly is the onboarding process like? Because the nightmare I imagine is I come on swap and then I got to connect these 100 different social networks I'm on. And without that, the, it's pretty much useless to me. Um, or I want to connect with somebody and then I have to make sure that they've connected as many different social networks as they're on, which is unlikely in both cases. Are right. you leveraging, like, are you maybe, you know, searching the person's email and then drawing all the other social media information mm -hmm. or their phone numbers and stuff like that? Or are you just basically relying on the user to onboard themselves completely before right. it's useful for them? Well, right. one of the guys who built it, Scott, do you want to answer? Yeah, so uh, I'm Scott Davis. Uh, I'm based here in Little Rock. Um, the contact book, we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, in fact, we have some patents surrounding some of the logic associated with this, but the main goal is that if, if you update your contact information, it's automatically synced to me. So if you change your phone number today, you just bought a new iPhone, you don't have to send out that awkward email that's like, hey, everybody, you can now reach me on this other phone number and half the people don't read it, and then they reach you, text you on your old number and, and somebody else, right? So we automatically take care of that process. It's synced into your contact book. Oh, giving a little bit more detail, when, when I try to connect with you, um, 
if, if you're already on swap, we detect that. We automatically connect us within swap itself. Um, but anytime you add a new network, we can see it automatically. Um, you get to control what access I have to your information. So if you don't want me to have your email, you can deny that. What's great about that is if you remove that at a later time, it automatically comes out of my contact book. So you get to control what information I can see of yours. Um, and there's a lot of other pieces to it, and I'm just trying to keep it brief for this, this discussion, but did you want to talk, touch on the onboarding piece? Yeah, sure. So uh, one of our designers, uh, he's very big. I mean, that's one of his biggest things because, I mean, one of the problems we're trying to solve is the fact is that that number, I, I, I would thought personally, because personally this is who I am, but uh, most of society, I think, is, is heading a different direction. I thought we'd get to the point where we, we'd be pretty good at just a couple things and, and stay on those and put everything on that. But really, those numbers keep increasing as far as the different networks that everyone's on. People want to communicate, especially brands, very specific ways. And they use these different platforms, these new platforms that are coming out to uh, as tools to reach people in ways that previous tools or previous networks weren't able to, to communicate with people before. So what we wanted to do in creating Swap is we wanted to ease this burden. We wanted to make it simple. And our, one of our designers uh, very much wanted to make the onboarding process uh, complete, the exact opposite of that problem that could happen, which is someone could feel very overwhelmed. We want it to be people are communicating and connecting with people on so many different things, and we wanted to provide one place that, for no matter the situation, whether it was you trying to use this uh, to reach out to family, or you trying to use this to reach out uh, for a business purpose, or I don't know, a romance purpose, whatever the reason, we communicate and connect with people for everything, right? And there should be one tool to use or to, uh, that should work in all those scenarios. And that was the difficult part in building this. And our solution, we believe, um, is the correct solution in order to solve that problem, to be a universal tool. But for onboarding, um, how do you make it so it's not overwhelming to somebody that they aren't, uh, because, I mean, that's how you get someone in, because it's not really until uh, you're in a network that you really understand really the high or the full extent of the purpose, right? And so we didn't want that to be a roadblock is, okay, if someone signed up because they heard about it, who knows how, they download it and they get in there and the onboarding process is just overwhelming and, or it takes 10 minutes and especially how do you make it, and that's really the tough job that our developers had was how do you make it so uh, all these networks that work very differently. Instagram and Twitter work very differently than Facebook and LinkedIn. And how do you make it so there's one, that they all kind of sync up with each other and make it so it's not overwhelming to a user? And uh, that was a problem. Uh, hopefully I understand your question correctly, but it, that probably took us more time than anything else. Like that was one of the biggest problems that we saw. And uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the best technology to make it as easy and simple for the user, but also um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it the core of the product is, like I tried to uh, mention before, is what Swap has in common that you won't be able to find any other place is that everyone on there has a phone number attached there. This is where you can go to connect with someone on at least that one platform. That what's amazing about LinkedIn, it's all about business connections, yet most people on LinkedIn still do not trust LinkedIn with their phone number because that's not what they signed up for. They signed up to use LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn was around three years before Facebook, and it took Facebook to prove the, the, the concept of a, a network that we're like, okay, we can apply this now to business. But um, most people I'm connected with on LinkedIn I don't have their phone number. So uh, if Dan's trying to reach out to me and, uh, and to connect with Scott, um, who's to say that I'm even that well connected with Scott on LinkedIn? Who's to say that I even have his phone number to try to make a proper, or email address to make a proper introduction? And so what we decided to do was to simplify that, was that important element, that is how you get people in. And then anything else they want to add on top of that, they can do on their own time after having the experience of going through the app and really understanding its full purpose, because the, the purpose of Swap is however you want to market yourself. And for everyone, that's going to be extremely different. So to come up with one, one complicated onboarding process that perhaps works for you differently than it works for me, uh, it, we wanted to try to avoid that. So the one thing that we all have in common on Swap is you can go there and, and be able to request someone's phone number. And so that's what we decided to simplify it we simplify it to that, 
get the user in, and as, this, as soon as the user is in there and realizes how perhaps they want to use Swap to grow their network or to stay connected with their network or to further connect in their network, um, that they can determine that themselves and then go back in and add whatever thing that seems relevant to them. So hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, let's so, give it up for Mitch and you Swap. And uh, we're going to get uh, E hooked up here, and he's going to present. E is with Flutterwave. Flutterwave is one of our VC fintech portfolio companies that's here for 12 weeks. Uh, we hope he will stay for longer, uh, and if we do a good job, then he will. Um, so E is coming up, uh, and he's going to tell you about how he is building payments infrastructure across Africa, and it's really exciting. So uh, the same we did with Mitch, let's build the energy in the room because I suck it all out. Give it up for E. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Amazing. Wasn't that great? You don't suck energy out of the room. What are you talking about? I don't know, is this thing on? Perfect. Cool. Well, hi everyone. Good morning. I'm going to be a whole lot more boring than, you know, the earlier speaker because we work on stuff no one sees, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll try and make it as interesting as I can. Um, and pardon my slides, they're not as fancy as uh, the previous speakers, but, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, my name is E, and I'm CEO of Flutterwave. And um, we're, as, as, um, as Brian earlier said, we're part of the VC FinTech program. Um, and we're building payment infrastructure for Africa. So what does that mean? Well, how many of you made a POS transaction this morning or in the last 24 hours? Amazing. And you had no worry in the world when you put your card in that machine that if you did have money in your account, and you know, as poor startup founders, sometimes that's not the case, um, that the transaction will go through. Well, you see, for millions of people in Africa, that is not the case. You have to plug and pray. So, you know, I've been to many stores and had the embarrassing experience of putting my card in a machine, and it pops up that receipt, transaction failed, please contact your bank, and the money might have left your account, and you've got to go to the bank for another couple hours so you can get it sorted out and get your money back, and you may never get your money back. <laughs> and that is just one of many problems that plagues payments across Africa. The cards simply don't work, right? And then, as if that was not enough, it's not inclusive. Unfortunately, most people actually do not pay with cards. They would rather pay with their bank accounts or with mobile money, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. And those systems are not connected to the transactions and payment infrastructure that the whole country uses. They're not secure. In Nigeria alone, banks lost over $90 million to fraud. That's a lot of money. And finally, it's not global. So a lot of, a lot of um, uh, um, um, banks and a lot of uh, payment systems don't extend outside of the country where they operate. So you can't do real-time international payments. You cannot acquire transactions with a foreign bank. There are so many things you cannot do because you're not local. And the reason why that is, is actually really just simply because of the way the payments infrastructure has evolved. So this wasn't something that was super thought out. It was just something that came together. And we've got really weird stuff like MasterCard transactions and Visa transactions are acquired by two different companies. And so you might walk into a store and your transaction will fail because there is a separate POS for MasterCard than there is for Visa. And the attendant doesn't know the difference. And you can't expect him to know that. <laughs> and so you put a MasterCard into a Visa POS and the transaction will fail. And that's basically how it works. And then there's so many integrations which add more cost create more needs for more upgrades, and create so many problems in the ecosystem that essentially your basic transactions cannot go through because you've got to swim through all this mass of blob and, and stuff. 
So, what is the consequence? Cash. Cash is king in Africa. This graph here is a graph of cash withdrawals versus everything else. So you've got a scenario where, you know, my transaction failed, so I'm just gonna walk over to the next ATM or into a bank and get my cash out and then walk right back to the merchant and pay him because that is really the only reliable way to do that. But the challenge is, you know, with many African countries, we've got very low value currencies. So, you know, the dollar isn't worth a dollar, that kind of thing. So you got a 50, a 100 Naira note that's, or a 100 Naira note that's worth maybe 200 Naira, right? Because most of these currencies are printed here, not in Africa, and so they cost more to print. And that creates huge systemic issues for payments across the country because it actually then costs money to, to pay people, right? And that cost is an estimated 1.5% of Africa's GDP. That's huge. It's a couple billion dollars, just to put that in context. And so what we decided to do was take up the responsibility of rebuilding the entire payment infrastructure for Africa from the ground up. Daunting task, yes, but as you will see, we're a team that has done crazy stuff before. And what that means is we have enabled a payments processing technology and infrastructure where we partner with the banks to be able to process mobile payments and POS payments and cash tokens and cards, also all card schemes, bank account payments and e-wallets using the same infrastructure. And everything is driven by API. The banks don't have to pay for the infrastructure. We take care of all of that cost. And it is super, super, super secure. We've got QSEs on our team and we've got our infrastructure in one of the most secure servers, server farms in the whole of Africa to ensure that there is no chance of fraud. And so this is how it works, right? I'm a customer, I walk to my store and I present whatever form of payment I want, whether it's my card, or I want to make a mobile money transaction, or I want to use the web, or I want to use you know, a, a wallet system, or whatever it is. And then what we do is we sit behind the payment service provider. So we sit behind you know, whoever is going to give those systems to the merchant. We sit between them and the bank, and the bank leverages our infrastructure to process all forms of payment. So this makes it a lot easier for the bank because then they don't have to graduate to become technologists. And it makes it a lot easier for the PSPs because then they don't have to invest in the technology. We can just take all that risk, all that opportunity for them, while all they have to do is engage with the merchant, get the merchant to make the transactions, and all the banks do is what banks do, which is bank money. This is a long value proposition slide, so I'm not gonna get too much into it, but the idea here is really simple. Three things, right? Number one, no cost for anybody else in the ecosystem. We take on all infrastructure and technology costs. And that is great for us because the economies of scale um, enable us to take on more and more of these transactions and scale more efficiently because we're taking on all of that risk for the entire ecosystem. The second thing is you can do every single form of payment. So you don't have to go build a different system for mobile money and then integrate somebody else tomorrow or this or that. You just have one system and it works for everything right out of the box. If there's any integrations that need to be made, we'll do it. If there's anything that needs to happen, we'll do it, right? And most importantly, right, you get a real-time view of transactions across the ecosystem. So you don't have to worry about, am I gonna get a report tomorrow or next week or whatever. And depending on the bank, you can actually do real time same day settlement. We already do that in Nigeria in a lot of banks, but it really depends on the bank's appetite, whether or not they wanna do it. And, and most importantly for our merchants, one thing that we've, we've, we've seen a lot of traction with large US merchants who want to do real-time payments or want to get paid or pay in real-time across Africa. So that includes aid organizations doing conditional cash transfers into Africa. They don't want a middleman. They want to make sure that all the funds they collect go directly to, you know, Safiat in the village, wherever she lives, on her mobile phone, 
that is possible with our technology. Or Uber wants to make sure its passengers can pay it in the U.S. in real time. That is also possible with our technology. And these are a few of our clients, very happy clients, who we've worked with over the years. Our bank partner, Access Bank, who we worked with to revolutionize their payment system and give them a top-of-the-grade payment system with pay recapture, which enables NFC payments and QR code payments in real time. And we worked with a company called Pay Recapture, where we enabled them to grow on our infrastructure from zero to one million users and onboard 35,000 merchants with no cost to them. And then finally, Uber, which we worked with to essentially do local acquiring using all payment types, card payments, local and international, mobile phone payments, cash payments, and enable them to get their funds out in the U.S. in record time. And this is a sense of our traction since we started. We've processed $14.5 million in alternative payment transactions since we started four months ago. And we've processed $1.4 million for global Silicon Valley companies that are doing business across Africa. Um, we've got 35,000 merchants on the platform, leveraging our, prof, our, our platform to do that. And we've integrated 30, 30 plus global payment providers because these are the guys who are facing the merchant. They're the ones who go out and acquire the merchant. We don't, we don't, we're not in the merchant acquiring business. We work with these guys and empower them so that they can provide best of class technology to their merchants and enable them to settle their funds anywhere in the world. And we have seven banking partners across, across the country. So why are we doing this? Well, $760 billion in payments are made by Africans every year. Within Africa, not even outside, just within. $760 billion. And it is projected to grow 215% over the next three years as more and more Africans are connected. And just, this just gives you a sense of what kind of growth we're talking about. Over the last three years, electronic payments have doubled, despite all the challenges I mentioned. Despite the fact that when you plug and pray, it might not work. People still want to pay using digital means. And so, and, and the question is, you know, what's driving all this stuff? Well, really simple, right? Number one, mobile phones. One billion mobile phones in Africa by 2030. And we have whole countries running large amounts of the economy, up to 70% of mobile money. So when you're talking about p advancements in payments, we're a little bit ahead of you guys. That's not a bad thing. Um, the second thing is e-commerce explosion, right? Because there is absolutely no malls, right? There are very few malls in Africa, and everything is retail trade. A lot of merchants are putting their goods up online for trade or on social media networks. And that is completely blowing up the e-commerce landscape and enabling people to want to do transactions online or using modern payment systems. And then finally, because of the problem I mentioned earlier, remember the problem about cash costing more than cash is actually worth? Well, central banks are like, look, it's a lot cheaper for me to move all these payments online where I don't have to print any money so that my cash is, is I'm not paying for cash to exist. Oh, sorry. So, I mean, this is a lot of, you know, complex stuff and probably only matters to the VC FinTech guys. But just, I just want to highlight one thing, which is that we're going up against a billion dollar company. Antiquated, old technology they didn't build themselves, unlike us who actually built our technology from zero, right? And not connected to the global economy in any way, shape, or form. That's our competition. And we're pretty confident that we can take, take them on. And a lot of these globally focused firms are firms that we are currently working with and integrated into. And this is just a sense of the level of care we take with the data, our users' data. We, we tokenize every single, all the information that customers have, and we ensure that those are passed along our tokenization layer in a very, very secure manner. And another thing we do is we provide extra care by providing KYC and audit trails for AML transactions because we want to make sure that the funds are not illicit. So we're a very big part of policing funds that are flowing across the world from Africa and to Africa. Here's a sense of our reach currently. 
or in two countries completely connected, we've processed over a million dollars of transactions in those. And in these countries, well, sub $200,000 in transactions and growing very quickly. And those are gonna come online in full force really soon. Some of them already have. This is a sense of what we're doing over the next couple months. Um, and some sense of our pricing. <laughs> um, very, very low pricing, so very low monthly subscription fee, and then we charge per transaction, which makes it really affordable for, for a lot of African banks and PSPs who cannot afford to fork over a million dollars for a switch or, or things like that. And this is the team. Um, I've worked with a lot of US companies that are looking to do business across Africa. My last company, Andela, um, helped US businesses and businesses across the world really find Africa's most talented developers. And this was companies like Facebook and Google and IBM. And Facebook loved what, I, what we built so much that Mark Zuckerberg invested $24 million in my company. Um, my co-founders, Benga GB, as we call him, um, he's a mobile fintech expert and he holds the patents for NFC and QR code payments um, as done in Africa. Um, and also my other co-founder, ACA, he wrote the rules for e-payment regulation in Africa. So we've got a team of folks who've been in really deep in this industry and really understand what it takes to rebuild Africa's payment infrastructure. Um, I'm just gonna skip through. I'm just gonna talk about, we, we're a Y Combinator company. I don't know how many people know Y Combinator here, but we're a Y Combinator company. So we've, um, we, we are in their program we're also a VC fintech company, which we're very proud, proud to be. So top startup accelerator in the world, top fintech startup accelerator in the world. So pretty high quality company here. We've raised quite a, quite a bit of money um, you know, to be able to do this. And in terms of what we're looking for, because I know Brian's looking at me, <laughs> um, we're really looking for three things. So the first thing is we're looking to partner with local banks who want to go international from day one. African corridor alone, we're talking $40 billion just in remittances. And we're not even talking about possibilities with real-time hedge fund trading. And we're not talking possibilities with business to consumer payments in real time. There's so many opportunities for doing business in Africa. And the, the, the size of our network enables us to be able to scale massively because we're connected into this massive Pan-African bank networks. So you, you're scaling with us, we're partnering with banks that are in many different countries at the same time and can navigate, help you navigate the regulation piece and everything. And we take care of technology piece so you don't have to deal with AK technology. The second thing we're looking for are payment service providers that want to service Africa. So you're running a small payment service um, and you want to scale into Africa, we'll make that super easy for you. It's just one integration and then you get everything, right? Makes it super easy. And then. I'd say the final thing we're looking for um, is talent. We're looking for senior folks who have done this before and who can help us rapidly scale because we're getting to that point. Um, we're probably going to be approaching $20 million in transactions over the next couple months, and we're looking to triple that if some of the partnerships we're working on at the VC FinTech come through over the next year. So if you're looking for a rocket ship, um, looking to impact the lives of lots of people in Africa by opening them up to global economic opportunity. But well, we're your guy. Thank you. All right, let's give it up for E. <laughs> and we've got a little long. I think we've got time for at least one question. Do we have anybody have a question for E uh, about Flutterwave? Sure. Did I really go on that long? Oh, you're good. <laughs> So I'm just curious, you said if 14, it was 14 million yeah. right now with transactions. What was that process like? I know that's a very open-ended question, yeah. but going from that first dollar to that amount, like what was the time frame with that and how, yeah. what was the biggest hurdle you had in getting to there? Uh, I mean, I'll, <laughs> should I answer? Okay. Um, oh, I forgot I had this. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we started a couple months ago and what that required, you know, because we're a B2B company. That required us to really extensively test our technology with the banks and build really close relationship with them. And that's, that's what we do well, because we've been in the industry, we know the players, and the players know us well. 
and he trusts us that we are not going to, you know, mess up what they've, what they've spent all their lives building. And what we had to do was extensively test our technology and build strong relationships with the bank. Start small, so we started with card processing, and then over time kind of grew into alternative payments and mobile money. And most importantly, bring opportunities to our customer, the bank. So we're, we're out here in, in Little Rock and in Silicon Valley pitching U.S. companies that are thinking about an Africa expansion and telling them, hey, we've got the technology and we've got the partners to serve you. So bring, bring it on, bring on your transactions. And that, that's basically what it took for us to get to that point. It's, it's a lot of high stakes um, um, you know, business development work, but this is stuff we've done all our lives, so we know how that works really well. Thank, Thank you. you. So two quick questions. Yeah. How old are you, and then what do you like about Little Rock? <laughs> Amazing. Well, I'm 25, but I've been doing this for a while. I uh, started, started working in tech when I was 18, so not, uh, <laughs> I've, been, I've been around. Um, and um, Little Rock, I love, love, love the community with Little Rock, and it reminds me a lot of where I went to school. So I went to school in the University of Waterloo, and very much like Little Rock, lots of large established companies um, with lots of very experienced executives, and you know, a, a huge focus on mentorship and building community and supporting community. And I love how accessible all the big shots are, like a Scott Ford just you know, walks in here, you know, and, and the Lieutenant Governor is just like buddy-buddy with us. You know, and I, I've been in the governor's office a couple of times, and Bill Clinton shook my hand. So, you know, it's a, I never see the opposite. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty amazing to see how communities coming together to really support this. And I think this is the start of something special. I mean, Waterloo went from, you know, not considered a factor to number 16 startup ecosystem in the world, according to the rankings. And I see this being, you know, with programs like VC FinTech and many other programs that are, that are similar to that. I see this being the center of the fintech world in, in a very short period of time. And you know, I'm excited to be, to be kind of pioneers there and to be part of it. And looking forward to, to staying if I get the right package from the governor. We'll see. <laughs> All right, thanks. Let's give it up for E. Thank you. Right. And, and we're not done quite yet. We, like we said at the beginning, there is an ask. If there's anybody that you can introduce E and Flutterwave, or Mitch and his team with Swap to, uh, to increase their network, to gain traction, to get users. Uh, please write it down on a business card. If you don't have a business card, you can raise your hand. Ashley will come around and give you a pen and uh, a Lift the Rock slip. You can, you can write it down and then, there we go, we got one. Uh, and then uh, we can deliver those to Ashley uh, right after the program. So. Uh, Feel free to stick around, enjoy Cowork Wednesday, network, grab coffee, uh, finish off the muffins. Uh, Jess, you got some? Uh, it's fine. I know. <laughs> Thanks, let's break.